first case in front of us today is NRA NAP and NCD, and um, each side will have 15 minutes to present their arguments to the court. I will be keeping time, and the appellant may reserve up to five minutes. May it please the court, opposing counsel, I'm attorney Joseph F. Salzgeber on behalf of the appellant father, Christopher Pavlik. Uh, it's our argument in this case that the trial court, the Medina County Juvenile Court, erred and abused its discretion in terminating the parental rights of father, Mr. Pavlik, and granting permanent custody to Medina County Job and Family Services Agency that its findings were against the manifest weight of the evidence and that the court used its discretion by denying Mr. Pavlik's motion for a six-month extension of the existing case plan for reunification of both children. By way of background, uh, there are two children involved, Malachi Pavlik and Mackenzie Pavlik. Um, Malachi was born in July of 2008 and his younger sister Mackenzie was born in October of 2009. Um, this matter came before uh, the court on a neglect dependency uh, charge that was filed by the agency um, in May of 2013. Uh, both parents agreed to predispositional custody uh, to the agency. A GAL was appointed, this was all in May of 2013. A case plan for reunification with both parents was submitted by the agency in July, and there was uh, subsequently an agreed finding of dependency in October of 2013. Uh, with the disposition of temporary custody to the agency with an updated case plan for reunification with the parents that was in December of 2013. Um, progress was made by father in the case plan um, and unfortunately no progress was made by the mother, Ms. Lynch. She simply, uh, for whatever reason, did not comply with really any aspect of the case plan. Father, however, did um, he had been diagnosed with ADHD um, and some other problems, uh, antisocial personality disorder, um, and some alcohol problems. Um, however, he made progress during the case plan uh, such that the court had review hearings in March of 2014 and June of 2014, and on both uh, those occasions continued temporary custody uh, and allowed the case plan to work itself out. Uh, unfortunately, the agency then moved for permanent custody um, on April 22nd of 2014 for a termination of parental rights. Is it enough just to make some progress on your case plan? Because there were obviously some very substantial things that father had not accomplished. Well, for purposes of, um, of requesting an extension of six months, I think that obviously if there's no progress being made at all, um, then that would clearly be within the court's discretion to say, uh, you're not making any progress whatsoever. Another six months is not going to make any difference. And with, with regard to Mother Miss Lynch, um, that, would, that was true. She was not making any progress whatsoever. She was not cooperating. Um, she had some other issues going on. Um, I believe she was pregnant during much of this time, so she could not uh, take medication. Um, but she was, regardless, not making any progress on issues that would not have been impacted by medication. Mr. Pavlik, however, was making progress in the plan. And, uh, and, and that's what I'm getting at. You just keep saying he was making progress. It doesn't, doesn't have to be some substantial progress because at this point he didn't even have housing, right? Uh, yes, that, and that was the testimony of uh, Mr. Wilkins, his, his concern, Meet Wilkins, uh, with the agency. Uh, his concern at hearing in July of 2014 was the lack of progress on housing. Um, however, Mr. Pavlik wished to live in Cuyahoga County, um, and he was living in Medina County uh, with Mrs. Lynch's foster mother, Ms. Schlacht, uh, in a trailer at the back of her property. Um, the plan was for once the child was born, once Ms. Lynch's infant was born, that they would be moving into the house itself. Um, so there was uh, housing available, uh, but he was at that time living in a trailer. Uh, he testified at hearing that he had saved up $500 towards a deposit on an apartment and that that was something that he felt would, that he could have to pay stable housing if given the six-month extension. So this, just so that I'm clear, this would have been a second six-month extension? 
Um, this would have been a final extension. There was an extension in March of 2000 and a review hearing in March of 2014 and another review hearing in uh, June of 2014. And the disposition of temporary custody of the, of the, to the agency was in December. So this would have been, yes, the second, the second, uh, doing the math, the second six-month extension. Um, and we believe uh, that, that based on the facts of this case, uh, the fact that progress had been made by a father, that he was in counseling, he had taken the parenting classes, uh, he had been out to visit the children, uh, which the, the placement of the children was a complicating factor because we're dealing with uh, individuals here, in particular Mr. Pavlik, uh, who were on Social Security disability, funds were very limited, and the placement was with a uh, foster family out in Port Clinton. So, you know, traveling was, was difficult, but he did make, uh, he did make it out there um, and visited seven times uh, with the children. And going through the various factors uh, with respect to 2151-414, um, concerning interactions with the child under D1A, Mr. Pavlik resided with both children at their Brunswick apartment immediately prior to uh, the agency taking predispositional and, and temporary custody in, in 2013. Uh, with respect to the D1B factor concerning the wishes of the child, um, the older child, Malachi, uh, was, according to the foster mother, able to make his wishes known, yet the GAL did not report uh, did not interview the children to report on those wishes. Uh, with respect to the D1C factor, the custodial history of the children, uh, the father and, and mother were the custodial parents uh, for all but five months of the children's lives prior to May of 2013. With respect to the D1D factor, um, concerning the child's need for legally secure placement or whether placement could be achieved without granting permanent custody to the agency, as I've indicated, Mr. Pavlik was making progress in the case plan of working towards reunification. Um, he had taken the parenting classes, was actively seeking um, housing. He had saved up $500 for an apartment and had housing lined up for when the baby was born. Um, he completed a mental health and psychiatric assessment following the recommended treatment plan, and he did visit with the children out in Port Clinton. His only admitted difficulty with the plan was the housing aspect due to financial constraints, but he had made progress by saving $500 towards the lease deposit and felt that he could, within the six-month period for which he was seeking an extension, uh, accomplish that particular goal. What were his plans to accomplish that goal? Um, he had set aside, uh, once he... He's got 500 set aside. Right, once he's got the money to, to get an apartment, he, he, they were able to maintain an apartment in Brunswick for a number of years, and when they lost that and lost the deposit, um, finances were largely the issue. So it's our argument, based on the progress that Mr. Pavlik made um, and the factors. Uh, counsel, did you want to save some time? Uh, yes. Okay. Did you want five minutes or less? Um, whatever the balance is. Okay. You still have uh, seven minutes left. So I have a question. Are you going to get into the GL? Ah, uh, yes, and I'm proceeding to that uh, second assignment area, Your Honor. And this is the more novel of the two, um, uh, based on my research into the case law. In this particular case, we're arguing that the uh, juvenile court erred and abused its discretion by considering the guardian ad litem report, which was submitted to the court on July 22nd, 2014, prior to the permanent custody hearing uh, in that month, and the recommendations of Mr. Pavlis' parental rights be terminated and custody be granted to the agency where the GAL failed to comply with the minimum requirements for guardian ad litems under Superintendent's Rule 48D13, uh, uh, by specifically failing to meet with and interview Mr. Pavlik, failing to observe his interactions with the children, Malachi and Mackenzie, and failing to uh, determine the wishes of one or both children. Um, I realize that the Ohio Rules of Superintendents uh, generally do not provide rights uh, which can be vindicated on the part of um, parents in this situation or defendants in criminal type cases. Um, however, where the guardian ad litem just does not comply with Superintendent's Rule 48D, uh, um, at least one court in this state has indicated that, uh, that that was a problem and that uh, 
It could not be considered competent, credible evidence of the best interest of the children in these types of cases. Uh, that was the Nolan v. Nolan case out of the 4th District. Um, as in the Nolan case, the GAO in this case fell below minimum standards uh, for Superintendent's Rule 48 uh, D13 uh, that her report and recommendations uh, should not have been considered competent, credible evidence of the court to, on the part of the court uh, of the children's best interest because the GAO did not individually meet with Mr. Pavlik, did not observe him during his visits with the children, um, did not even know if the parents had uh, given her the contact information which they had during one of the hearings in the case, and there was no effort to determine Malachi, at least Malachi's wishes, where the foster mother had testified uh, that he could make his wishes known. Based on the foregoing, we would ask that this court sustain the assignments of error, both assignments of error, reverse the judgment of the juvenile court, terminating the parental rights of Mr. Pavlik and granting custody to the agency, and remand the case for further proceedings with instructions to grant his request for a six-month extension of time to complete the case plan. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honors. I'm Jennifer Moore, and I represent Nevada County Job and Family Services. And uh, as opposing counsel put it, we are here regarding Malachi and Mackenzie Pavlik and what is in their best interest. From the agency's position, uh, it is that permanent custody and termination of parental rights is, in fact, in Malachi and Mackenzie's best interest. I think, to um, you know what, probably, and I didn't even think about this, I apologize um, in regard to when an appellant argued. But why don't we go ahead and just use their initials? Oh, fine. You know, because we're technically supposed to do that. Yes, I apologize, Your Honor. No, 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 it's okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm learning all this stuff, too, so. We've had these children for quite some time, so I'm just used to oh, saying their names. Of course, um, and that personifies them more to the court, but just an in interest of them. Absolutely. Okay. As I stated, the children, uh, we've been, the agency's been involved in the children, with the children for quite some time. Two of the main issues here uh, would be whether or not the court uh, abuses discretion in denying father's motion for a six-month extension of custody. Uh, Mr. Salzgaber kept saying that father made progress on the case plan, and the court posed a question about the level of progress. I think it's clear from the statute that the level of progress needs to be substantial, and Mr. Pavlik did not make substantial progress on his case plan. He, the case plan was officially ordered in December of 2013, but was created prior to that. And the agency made reasonable efforts prior to it being ordered to engage parents in services. Mr. Pavlik was incarcerated for a period of time from, I believe it was uh, late December of 2013 till February of 2014. During that time, we tried to engage him in services. He did a few services in jail. Upon his release from that, um, he did make three appointments for mental health um, with his mental health professional to get assessed. He did not do the parenting assessment as was required by the case plan. He did not have housing, uh, as was required by the case plan. And uh, some of his diagnoses, including the antisocial personality disorder, it was testified to by Dr. Marianne Chi, who is um, a licensed psychiatrist with uh, Solutions Behavioral Health Care, that someone with that diagnosis would need serious intervention, including medication, uh, which Mr. Pavlik refused to take. <coughs> So the, he was not forthcoming in where he was living with the agency as testified to by Director Wilkins, who was the caseworker. Therefore, it would be our position that substantial progress was not made and therefore it was not in the best interest of the children that parents be granted a six-month extension to continue work on their case plan. With regard to the best interest factors, there was testimony from numerous people regarding the interaction and interrelationships of the children with their parents during the 14 months between the time the agency filed the case and the time that the um, permanent custody hearing uh, was held, parents had uh, minimal visits. Uh, mother had 12 visits, father had seven. And those visits um, were actually done in Medina County. The agency would provide the transportation for the children to get back to Medina County, even though they were placed in Port Clinton. And parents were then given gas card from wherever they were residing at that point 
they resided in Mansfield, Ashland, and Lodi during the pendency of the case, and they were given gas cards to get to the agency for the visits with their children. They did not have to travel to Port Clinton. So parents had limited visits during the 14 months uh, that the children uh, were in agency custody at that point. The GAL did actually interview the child, she, both children. She testified that she had seen them eight times in their placement um, throughout the pendency of the case, that she did have trouble seeing visits because the visits were so sporadic. What would happen is the agency would schedule them and then parents would cancel the visit. So the GAL really couldn't get to any of the visits because of the sporadic nature of the visits. Uh, but she did say that she talked to Malachi about, sorry, I apologize, uh, that she did talk to the older child about where he wanted to be placed and how he was living and he was happy where he was at. So she did um, comply with that role of superintendence. Um, as stated in my brief, uh, the agency uh, presented evidence that this was not the first case with the children and their parents and that in totality, by the time we had the permanent custody hearing in which the older child the older child was six and the younger child was four, they were actually in agency custody for 19 months, uh, which is over a year and a half of their lives. Parents had a history of evictions, uh, which did not bode well for a legally uh, substantial and permanent and safe, stable placement uh, as required under the best interest. So we would state uh, that the GAL did comply with Superintendent's Rule 48 and in addition, there was testimony beyond the GALs regarding the best interests of the children with regards to whether or not they should be placed in permanent custody. Well, that me, excuse me, Mark, but let me ask you about the GALs report. The trial court actually found that the GAL did not comply with 48, right? I believe he said that she was below the bar of 48, um, that she should have tried to have done more. She did testify that she saw parents at court hearings and at we hold both um, semi-annual reviews and case reviews at the agency. If parents showed up to that, she did see that. Um, from the agency's position, uh, it was kind of hard I, for the GAL to see parents where they were living when in fact most of the case we didn't even know where they were living. Um, so it's hard to interview them and do a home visit. But I, I believe that he did say that she could have done better with regards to seeing the parents. Um. And I guess in looking at the trial court's order, um, he talks about how she didn't really meet all the requirements, but he would assess it, or I don't know if he or she right now, would assess it uh, with the weight that it should be afforded. But then said something about even though that, you know, that the, well, the guardian at Alive had indicated her belief that the children were too young to verbalize her wishes, but yet, uh, the foster parent said the opposite, and then you just said the opposite. So what do you do with that? She did, uh, in the original um, cross-examination by the uh, father's uh, trial attorney, um, she, in response to the question, she did state that she believed that they were overall too young to make, I want to live here, I don't want to go home, because they were six and four at the time. Uh, however, she did state that she talked to them about where they were living, that they were happy where they were living at, um, and I think from that standpoint, uh, in accordance with the, the case law on this, uh, that uh, it, she has to kind of make a determination based upon her conversations with the children, not necessarily a where do you want to live because of their age and their lack of maturity, but kind of see how happy they are. She talked to them about... Um, how visits went with parents is what she, I believe she had testified to. Um, I, I think there was some back and forth um, about um, whether or not the older child could verbalize what his wishes were. And I know at one point um, the school personnel that did the Head Start program up in Port Clinton had said that he was able to verbalize what he wanted in class. But again, I think that's with due regard to the maturity of the child. Again, we're talking about a six-year-old child. So I think that it, from a talking to them standpoint, she, she met that standard. She interviewed the children to the best of their ability for the age that they are and used what they said in part to make her determination. Well, I guess maybe it's the whole problem is nomenclature and what we're talking here because the ability to verbalize their wishes is different than the ability to make a determination. 
where they should live. That's a completely different thing in a court at any way. But a six-year-old, I think, can clearly say, I like living with mommy or I like living with the foster parent. Um, so it's not that they can't verbalize unless there was something, obviously, a mentally, physically preventing them from being able to do that. Um, so it's not so much the way I'm looking at this is not so much not being able to too young to verbalize it, but they may be too long, too young, and too lack of maturity, I should say, to make a determination themselves. And I would I would absolutely agree with that position, but I, I think as part of a GAL's responsibility is to talk to the child, have them verbalize a little bit what they think, which is I believe Miss Leslie did in this case. She talked to the children. The older child said, yes, I like living where I'm at. Things are good here. They would tell about how things functioned in the, the kinship home that they're living in, which is a home that parents actually picked out for their children. So we placed the children where parents asked us to. Um, and so I think that Miss Leslie could take that in, into account when making her determination. But I think the age of the children um, does fall under the, uh, the, and I apologize, I don't remember the case that I had cited, in regards to, and I might not have even actually cited it in this. That's okay. Um, but there is case law out there that says, you know, it's it's for due regard and maturity of the child, and I think talking about a six-year-old and a four-year-old. Sure, but I guess my point is there are <coughs> two things. One, are we really talking maturity to what weight we're going to give it, and not a matter of ability to fertilize. But number two, why would you take that in consideration if the child is, in her mind, too immature to make the determination or to really express um, their wishes. Why would you take that in consideration for the foster parents? Well, I, I think that it would, it goes Should to a totality cut, of the cut circumstances. Both ways, right? I'm sorry? Should cut both ways, right? If they're too young and too immature to verbalize their wishes, why would you take that in consideration that they like living with the foster parents? And, and quite honestly, I don't know whether she took that into consideration. I personally would take that into consideration. Um, because I'd want to know if the child is happy where the child is at. Has the child blossomed? It's a totality of the circumstances. She testified that she saw a difference in the child in both children from their initial removal back in May of 2013 through several placements prior to the kinship placement and then how well they blossomed in the kinship placement. So I think a child saying, yes, I like living here needs to be taken into account in regards to all the other factors. Now, if I like living here is not a safe environment, obviously as a GAL, you wouldn't want to be like, okay, I'm going to give a lot of weight to what this child says, even though it's not safe. I think it's a balancing act. So what did the child say about living with dad? I don't recall any testimony regarding that. So that wasn't a question that's really talked about? I don't believe that it was, no. So it's hard to balance if you don't ask the other side, isn't it? And and I don't like I said I honestly don't know if if the other well, if that question was as to testify yes as testified to, testify to and I, I don't believe that that was testified All right, to that's fair that's fair thank you oh wait, wait I'm sorry yes I had no I, I actually finished right before you <laughs> asked your first question so if, are there any other I didn't mean to scare you off no no <laughs> not at all no, at all I was actually I finished right before you asked that question so. Thank you very much. Thank you. And you have four minutes and 20 seconds. Oh, that's great. Um, I would just like to, uh, to emphasize that in Nolan v. Nolan, which was analogous to the instant case where the guardian ad litem likewise failed to satisfy the minimum standards set forth in Superintendent's Rule 48D13, uh, that although the fourth district concluded that the superintendent's rule did not have the force of the law, they did not believe that it should be ignored, and where the guardian ad litem fell so far below the minimum standards of that rule, uh, they failed to see how the testimony or report could be considered competent, credible evidence of the best interest of the child. Well, and that's true, and Nolan, Nolan was way off compared to, <laughs> compared to this case. And like you said, the substantial, um, not meeting even the substantial requirements or the, any of the minimum requirements. But even, even in this case, in its decision on page 10 of 13, uh, Judge Dunn indicated that uh, uh, the stated minimum standard under Superintendent Rule 48 uh, had not been met um, in this case. 
Uh, yet the court nonetheless did not strike the GAO report or the testimony from the record. So but, we have the court at least considering this report, which well, was not uh, in compliance with <coughs> Superintendent's Rule 48D13, where there's just no interview with Mr. Pavlik, um, no determination of the wishes of the child. You know, of course the children are going to say, well, I like being with my foster parent here in Port Clinton and with the other children and his sister. Um, but he was not asked, Malachi or... So your I mean, position he, is that it couldn't have been considered at all. If one little thing is wrong, you can't consider it. Because the court said, I'll afford what weight I think is necessary, or what weight should be given to it, considering but, but when, that the, the, the GAL did not meet the minimum requirement. And I would not say that that's one little thing. There were multiple reasons right. why I'm, it did not. I'm not saying in his particular right. case. I'm saying in general. If there's one thing that's missed, is that, does that mean the court should strike it? Well, if the court makes the determination, uh, as in this case, that the uh, minimum standards were not complied with by the GAL, then I don't see how the court could admit the report and consider it for any purpose if, if the minimum requirements for the preparation of that report and for the testimony uh, were not met. Uh, so on that basis alone, we would ask that the court reverse and remand with instructions to give another six months for as requested from Mr. Pavlik to uh, meet the requirements uh, specified in the plan. Furthermore, with respect to the first assignment of error, the uh, 2014 uh, when he was released from the Medina County Jail for, uh, for misdemeanor uh, offenses for which he was placed there. Mr. Pavlik himself um, had engaged in counseling even while he was in jail, participating in eight counseling sessions uh, with Ms. Hawk of alternative paths. Uh, he was actively engaged in counseling and meeting with a counselor once a week uh, at the time of the permanent custody hearing. And uh, he indicated his plans with regard to uh, obtaining housing and believed that within six months he would have no difficulty obtaining housing. Uh, so based upon the testimony in this case, the court's uh, consideration of the GAL report, which failed to meet the minimum standards under Superintendent's Rule 48, um, we would ask this court reverse and remand back to the trial court. Thank you very much. The court will take the matter under advisement and a written opinion will issue and be sent to both sides as well as it will be posted on the Supreme Court and the Ninth Report for the website when it is released. Thank you very much and thank you for coming to Summit County, number one and number two, for accommodating the court schedule. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.